This is my van parked at Redi Puglia, which is the Italian memorial to the First World War. It is the largest memorial I have seen anywhere. I don't know if it is larger than anywhere else. For example, the one in Volgograd for the Stalingrad battle must be pretty big, but it certainly looks to me to be much bigger than the one in Moscow. Maybe it is the largest, maybe it isn't. I don't know. But there's a very large car park here. There's a place here to leave your camper van. Although it's not very clear if you can leave your camper van or not. And this memorial, which was built in 1938, it was opened on the 18th of September 1938 by Mussolini, who a few days later went off to Munich to do the infamous Munich Accords, which the British and French kindly gave away parts of Czechoslovakia to the Nazis, and thus laying the seeds of the Second World War. But to return to the First World War, this memorial is built on the where the front line actually stood because the hill which is behind this building was captured on the 5th of June 1915. On my right there is a small museum. I've got some lots of interesting um, materials, but we're going to have to speak Italian. It's also got some good maps. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to walk up the, this hill here which was captured after a rather bloody battle in the beginning of June 1915. Now, Italy entered the war on the 24th of May 1915. The Austrians were prepared and they pulled out of the plain, uh, which was next the, to the Italian border, and they came into the foothills of the Alps, which is where this is now and if you look down there we've got a view of the Alps I hope that's coming out I can see it with the naked eye there in front is this enormous memorial that was built as I said opened in 1938 contains the bones of a hundred thousand Italian soldiers who died uh, on the Isonzo front and this hill here which was captured as I said in June of 1915 guarded now by these two weapons you can see in many photographs which I've actually published as well on my uh, my history site uh, the, the, the same guns have to have been captured in at Caporetto by the, the Austrians. These guns date to 1915 and the original war memorial or the, the graveyard was located on this hill. So we'll go up that now. We've got the name there, Sant'Elia. And so here we have the date. It was captured in the attack of the 9th of June 1915. And who was captured by so let's walk up here and I'm going to point out some they've got uh, things from the war such as the helmet and uh, the bayonet but there are one or two things I do want to point out which are quite unusual which is the return of the mace in warfare now the mace was something noted from medieval times a stick piece of wood or metal with a round spiky thing at the end of it used for hitting people especially in the face and this was returned initially probably I think by the Austro-Hungarians but then the Italians started doing them they, they were made by using um, bits of metal such as from grenades or bombs, but found some spiky bits to put on it. 
and then put together and here we go La Mazza Ferrata, the metal mace a new weapon from ancient times The weapons that we've got around here are largely from the First World War although there are things also from the Second World War Italy entered the First World War with only around 150 new artillery pieces By the time of the Battle of Caporetto it had improved so much so that it lost between two and three thousand artillery pieces over the, over the course of three weeks during that battle. Here we have what I think is a reconstruction of what a trench could have looked like. See the crenellations, and I have seen photographs with crenellations of uh, trenches uh, which were built in the Alps by both the Italians and the Austrians when I say Austrians I mean Austro-Hungarians in this sector of the front many of the troops on the other side on the Austro-Hungarian side were Sla Slavic uh, people for example uh, there was even on, on not so far from here on the Zonzo front was a, a mosque was built and here we have fascist propaganda uh, Italia 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 with a soldier on guard and there we have the date of it 4th of February 1941 the 19th in the year of fascism in the mountains artillery had a particularly dangerous effect because if you're on a muddy field or something like that and the shell lands in mud then if you, even if you're relatively close you'll be unhurt you may be knocked down by the blast but nothing worse if it is in mountainous terrain explodes on a mountainside uh, there'll be bits of rock flying around all over the place alternatively it might be winter which in itself can cause avalanches indeed in December 1916 it, I've seen estimates of between five and ten thousand people who were killed by avalanches in one place a Austrian barracks was completely buried under the avalanche In this tour I'll be going up into the mountains to see where the battles uh, there took place along the Zonza front. This is a partially restored pontoon. Bridges made from these pontoons were needed in a number of sections of the front not only to cross the rivers that were there before the war but those which were caused by the flooding which occurred deliberately as the Austrians initially retreated from this what is today this part of Italy during the Caporetto battle from 1917 the uh, Austrians and Germans managed to cross a number of rivers uh, including the Tagliamento which is really very very large uh, major uh, achievement in my opinion we have here a mortar position I don't think it's original now a mortar position is not as deep as a front line trench it's set back from the front line and today you'd have somebody some distance away seeing where the rounds were actually landing and communicating via radio in during the first world war whereas things like field telephones did exist and they certainly existed here 
but it's probably not very possible. I found photographs of Austri Austrian radios in use on the front here, but I doubt that they would be used for such things as, as mortars. It's still rather firing, to a large extent, firing blind. Uh, it's the look of the guess to, uh, to a large extent then. We have here an example of what is termed an armoured trench. That is to say, it's got much more protection than you would see in a normal trench. Now, in my opinion, this is largely a reconstruction, but not according to this sign here. Now, I'm sure the sign knows more than I do, but let's have a quick look at it because it's quite important. Uh, it says that it was constructed in June and July of 1915, it says the names of the units which actually did it, and this was something which have taken part during the first and second battles of the Isonzo. Now, the hill behind me, which you can't actually see because of the trees, was captured on the 5th of June 1915, so that's just over two weeks after Italy entered the war, and the border was only about 40 kilometers from here, so it took a long time for them to get going. The reason for that is possibly because of lack of artillery support. Well, if there's a lack of artillery support, maybe they should have thought about that before the declaration of war and maybe put the declaration of war off a bit. Nonetheless, the Austrians were expecting them to be coming uh, and they had been refortifying the area from around the previous summer. So despite the fact that Austria and Italy were both in the same alliance system. Another thing I need to point out is that the trees which are here now were not here then. I think they were not here before the, the war. Uh, I'm not absolutely 100% certain they certainly weren't here, the one photographs I've seen from uh, the period of the fighting. Now, let's have a look at the armoured trench, what this actually means is this. It's now the front uh, sort of stabilised just behind this hill, so it wasn't all that far from here. See that the it's covered, makes a lot of sense in a defensive mode. Uh, not much use if you've got to get out to attack, of course. Here, here it's not covered, but that could be because the roof has fallen off. But there's no parapet down. Oh, there is a bit of a parapet. Sorry for shooting on and coming around here we see some apertures there's an aperture for machine gun and there's some apertures for firing out of now let's come round and look at the scenery again because it's rather important it's a rather silly place to put a trench if the uh, hill up there was controlled by the enemy, then it doesn't matter how good it was down here, yeah, the movement would really be extremely restricted. So it doesn't really make much sense putting a trench here. Another problem would be the fact that there's a canal down there. And maybe it would be quite easy to get it waterlogged. I don't know, maybe, maybe not, I'm just guessing. That is the railway line, which goes from Trieste to Vienna. And was a major target of the Italian advance. So there's your parapet. Well, it's a bit, uh, I know the people were smaller then. Maybe the trench got filled in, I'm unable to say. Another thing, got a dugout there. Dugout is on the wrong side. Uh, dugouts would normally be on the left hand side, same direction as the enemy. That protected the soldiers inside from shells to a certain degree. So if you've seen the film, 
Black Battle Goes Forth. Six episodes. They've got their dugout on the wrong side of the trench. Now this makes a bit more sense, but no parapet. Maybe there was a parapet there once for firing from. I don't know. I suppose things like that might be handy for keeping ammunition in. And at the end, there's a position for a machine gun. I think that the roof would be somewhat impervious to a number of smaller shells. It wouldn't be the, the large ones, it wouldn't be. But the smaller shells, it certainly, it certainly would be, and uh, there'd be protection against blast as well, I think. And this is the end of the tunnel, I know, because I've been down here before. I've done another film, which you can see, on a trench network at Monfalcone, which has been restored. In that system, there are caverns which were enlarged by sappers during the war, and this was completed around March 1916, using natural caves. Very interesting. So, I know it's my own film, so I might recommend my own things, but if you're interested in this type of thing, you might want to see it as well. I have a lot more films about the First World War from this area and other areas, so please see my channel, which is www.youtube.com slash Alan Heath, or you can see my professional site, which is www.motorhome fulltime.com in which I've got all my travel films. As we walk up here we've got the names of battles and most of them are quite close to here starting with Seibusi which is just to the right. In the centre there's the tomb of the Duke of Ulster, who was the commander of the Third Army. He died in 1931. They're being school groups here. And what of them being school groups? They're not always that respectful of the location and what it is. It doesn't look like a cemetery, so maybe that's why they behave the way they do. As can be seen, we have the names of the people who've been killed, but not the dates. So we just pick one person. Here is Sigismondo Baldacci. With a name like that, he could well have been of German origin even. I'm just guessing, I don't know. Names you don't often hear these days Tancredi, Olindo, Tobia, Giacinto, maybe names that went out of fashion. And all ranks are mixed up as well, which is a good sign, I think. And it's not separated according to religion. Religion is not even mentioned. In the war with Turkey, 1911-1912, there were only two chaplains in the Italian army. By the time of the First World War, despite the dispute that the state of Italy had with the papacy, 
there were a lot of chaplains to go around. We can see photographs of mass being celebrated near the front line. The dispute Italy had with the papacy, which dated to the time of the unification of Italy, when the Italian state in 1870 conquered papal lands and took Rome, just leaving the Pope with the Vatican. And the Pope considered himself a prisoner in the Vatican. And until this problem was resolved, as it was by Mussolini in 1929, there was the conflict between the papacy and the state of Italy. Huge amount of work to build this. Italian deaths in World War I amounted to between 3 and 3.5% 3 of the entire population. Added to that, must be people who were injured, wounded, and looking at around. By the time an extra, well, it's difficult to decide how many, 1.2, 1.4 million, and the amount of people who had post traumatic stress disorder, which wasn't even diagnosed, uh, many people ended up in madhouses, asylums, because of it. I knew somebody, as a grandfather, a friend of mine, in 1992, and he still had severe post-traumatic stress disorder, and he must have been 100 by then, if not older. I think he died around 94, 95. So it shows how long he doesn't go away at all. 75 years later, he still had it. Obelix, which marks where Sergeant Giovanni Rossi fell on the 2nd of July 1915 when the hill was taken. Two thirds of the soldiers here are buried, but it's unknown who they were. Only one third could be identified. There we have 30,000 soldiers unknown and 30,000 on the other side as well from the third army. A chapel down there. These crosses stand out over a very wide distance. And see why? Well, come round here. I've got this fantastic view. Of course, it would be much better but if I'd been here in the morning to actually film it then. I thought about it this morning, but it was so cloudy, there wouldn't have been much point. One thing also I think that needs to be said, whereas this area here, which was Austria in front of me now, where the population was Italian speaking, but as they advanced, they, uh, they came into areas which, where the population was Slovenian. And they um, did not welcome liberation. In fact, under the Austrians, for example, if you take Gorizia, the school there, they spoke German, Slovenian, and Italian. But by 1927, 
only the Italian language was permitted. And in areas which were further to the east, such as by the time you get places like Caporetto, Cobari, where the Italian population would have been very small indeed, or places in Istria, in eastern Istria, where hardly anybody spoke Italian. Italy came into the First World War with a clear idea of what it was going to get out of it, unlike any other country. No countries had any war aims, in my opinion, not even Austria, who started it. But Italy knew what it wanted. Istria, a bit of Dalmatia. And the British government, more than happy to grant this, so Italy came into the war. But this meant annexing land, which wasn't really Italian. Now, in this area here, people went off and fought in the Austrian army. So you have people recruited in this area fighting in the battle of uh, Lvov in Galicia in the early winter of 1914. I was talking to a lady yesterday who told me that her grandfather, who was from Duino, which is quite close to Monfalcone. He was in the Austrian army. He must have. He was born in 1899, so I presume he went into the army in 1916 or 17. And he said that they used to. Both sides used to talk to each other. So of course neither side wanted to be there. And what she said that her grandfather would warn them, said, don't attack here, we've got machine guns. It's not worth it.